welcome back to our discussion of failure criteria, moving on to part two with a focus on fracture. Part one of this whole discussion of failure criteria focused mostly on plasticity and what happens when um, different types of materials are subjected to excessive loading, which could lead to permanent deformation and permanently changing the shape of those materials. But now we don't just care about what happens when the material changes shape while still maintaining the same relative connectivity. Now we're interested in what happens to the material if we really subject it to a lot of loads. What happens when it, it gets subjected to such high loads that the material just breaks apart? We call that fracture and it encompasses a whole domain of really interesting things that unfortunately we're just going to scratch the surface on. But we'll dive right into it and start our discussion by looking at uh, you know, why we actually care about fracture. And, and there's plenty of resources that I could point to that uh, you know, really explain this in great detail. And uh, you know, fracturemechanics.org, which is kind of the companion website to the very popular continuummechanics.org website, the same guy who kind of created that, uh, both of them exceptionally well uh, developed educational resources that I would highly, highly encourage you to look at if you're interested in learning more about this kind of stuff. Uh, besides also, there's a lot of other great slides out there. I'll point to some that were distributed by uh, Sandia, which does a lot of work on uh, practical applications of fracture mechanics to understand very complex mechanisms. And Sandia in particular, um, every year will release uh, the Sandia Fracture Challenge, which is kind of a uh, computational modeling and predictive um, anal an analytical challenge to you know, encourage different researchers and organizations to put to the test their fracture mechanics predictions to try to see when is some complicated part going to actually uh, start to fracture and do kind of interesting things like that. So they have a vested interest in um, you know, distributing educational materials on this. Uh, but really cool stuff. Check it out. Check out Sandia's Introduction to Fracture Mechanics as well as uh, you know, their ongoing yearly uh, you know, fracture challenge. It's very cool stuff. But why do we care about all this? Why, why do we care about fracture from an engineering point of view? Well, it probably seems obvious to you, at least from the civil engineering point of view. We care about fracture because, well, we, we don't want uh, our engineered structures to break. We don't want them to split apart. And, and that applies and happens to all kinds of different materials. It happens to steel, even though most of the time we're designing steel structures so that they don't undergo plasticity. Uh, it's still possible for steel structures to undergo modes of failure, in, including fracture. So we have to worry about it for steel. Obviously, we have to worry about it for concrete. I don't, I don't think there's a single concrete structure in existence that doesn't have uh, s some number of cracks in it. All concrete cracks and fracture is just a fact of life. So clearly, understanding fracture is incredibly relevant for understanding behavior of concrete and, and its durability and other types of kind of, uh, com you know, like cementitious composites or even asphalt concrete, you know, like uh, any kind of roadway material. If you're driving on the roadway, you encounter it all the time. And, and if you actually take a moment to look at the road that you're driving on, you'll notice millions upon millions of, of cracks everywhere. And, and it's just pervasive. Really, understanding fracture is absolutely essential for understanding durability and long-term performance of all kinds of different structures. And clearly, we want to prevent it as much as we can. But sometimes there's really nothing we can do about it, and we just have to live with it. And in those circumstances, it's worthwhile to know if I have a crack, you know, when will it extend? When will the cracks grow? And how can I predict that over time? Um, and ideally also, how do I prevent a, an existing crack from growing? How, how do I stop a crack from nucleating? All these kinds of things. And that's kind of what we're going to focus on in today's lecture. Now, there, there are different behaviors that you get out of different materials. It really depends on the mechanisms of what's happening in the material at sometimes very fine scales. But in broad terms, we can categorize the fracture behavior of different materials on sort of a, a spectrum of behaviors ranging from purely brittle fracture, which is kind of the phenomenon that you would get in a lot of types of uh, 
classically brittle materials, things like glass is kind of the classical material to which brittle fracture mechanics is most commonly applied and was originally developed actually. Uh, but it also applies to other similar materials like ceramics, you can think of bricks, uh, even steel to a certain extent. Certain types of high carbon steels behave in a relatively brittle fashion and won't really undergo a lot of ductility or, or plastic deformations, but rather they'll just fracture rather than you know exhibit any kind of plastic behavior. And also this is true of other types of metals if they're at relatively low temperature. And, in, and for most of these materials, what you'll see in like a stress drain curve, if you're maybe doing a uniaxial tension test on some uh, simple, you know, tensile specimen, what you might see is that you could load up the material up to some, you know, critical threshold and then instantaneously or nearly instantaneously, you'll see that you'll just have an instantaneous loss of load carrying capacity indicating that the material just undergoes practically no plasticity or any kind of plastic deformations, it just fails, it just fractures. So there's, there's no energetic dissipation through other kind of modes of, of uh, dissipation like plasticity or other times, types of permanent deformation behaviors. It just happens suddenly and instantaneously. Uh, now kind of at the intermediate range of these behaviors, you might have quasi brittle fracture which is still quite, you know, brittle in nature. And, and, you know, maybe these curves as I'm showing below are a little bit of an exaggeration, um, but really quasi brittle fracture uh, accounts for the fact that fracture doesn't necessarily happen instantaneously in a lot of materials. And what happens is really, there's a lot of microscopic changes that are happening uh, across multiple scales in rather complex materials that account for progressive damage and degradation of the load carrying capacity of these materials. Cracks might form, but there's complex mechanisms that control how quickly those cracks, you know, open. There's some kind of cohesive forces that prevent these cracks from, you know, just splitting open and, and being totally uncontrolled in how they grow. And that's true of a lot of materials like concrete, certain types of rocks, uh, you know, in other types of interesting structural materials, wood maybe is another good example. And then finally, on the other end of the spectrum is ductile materials. These are the materials that undergo a lot of plasticity, have a lot of load carrying capacity, and can deform a lot plastically. Uh, that's true of a lot of metals. Mild steel is an example, and other types of polymers. You can stretch them a lot, they'll plastically deform, and eventually, eventually, they, they don't pull forever. Eventually, they do ultimately fracture under some kind of, uh, you know, void growth and coalescence mechanism. But again, it's important to emphasize that the mechanisms governing fracture in these different types of materials on this spectrum of brittle to ductile fracture are quite different. And it's really not appropriate to apply certain concepts of fracture mechanics to all of these different classifications of materials. You kind of have to specialize your discussion of brittle fracture and, and kind of like fracture mechanics geared more towards the brittle fracture domain, which is really only where this classical linear elastic fracture mechanics really applies. It doesn't really apply so well in the case of ductile fracture. For that, you need kind of a little bit of a different approach. So just bear that in mind that a, lo a lot of classical developments in fracture mechanics are really geared more towards the left end of this spectrum, towards brittle fracture. But we can kind of still get away with applying them in certain contexts. It really depends. Um, now, on the subject of what's really going on in the material, at even just like the, the finest scales of potential interest. To do this, let's consider a, a, you know, a multi-scale perspective of fracture. And to do this, let's take a macroscopic view of a classical compact tension specimen, which is something that looks sort of like the figure shown at the left-hand side of the screen. It might involve some small or thin uh, plate-like uh, specimen geometry, like what's shown here, and with these two kind of rigid rods put through the ends of the specimen as shown here. And really, the, the goal of the compact tension specimen is to provide a repeatable way of producing fractures uh, in these sorts of you know carefully machined geometries that include sort of a open notch here and a very, very thin uh, crack 
that's you know given some initial length let's call it a which is pretty classical to call the initial you know the crack length is a usually now if we took a look at what's happening right at the crack tip we took a zoomed in perspective almost at like a you know let's say an intermediate scale or the micro scale really a, a relatively fine scale in the material where you might start to see like grains in a plastic uh, material or you might start to see aggregates and other things in concrete at that scale you know you'll notice uh, i'm not really representing a whole lot going on here but at this fine scale uh, you you might start to see some of those features uh, and at the even smaller scale, if we zoom in at the crack tip location, even on this zoomed in micro scale diagram, all the way down to the atomistic scale, really what we'd see is this packing of atoms. And you know, the crack tip is really indicated by just the lack of atomic bonds between you know, rows of atoms. So really the mechanisms of fracture across these different scales manifest in slightly different you know, observable behaviors. At the scale of the whole specimen, we'll see really just that this crack, which had an initial length A, has grown by some finite amount, delta A. And we call that, at least at this macroscopic scale, crack extension or crack growth. Now, that's a fairly coarse-grained view of what's really going on. If we go to that micro-scale perspective, what's happening in the material, it's worth mentioning that really what we'll see will depend very strongly on the type of material that we're looking at. But if, let's say, we're looking at oh fracture happening in some kind of metal, for example, like steel or other things like that, what you might see is, is something that looks like this, a much more complicated picture of multiple you know, cascading mechanisms contributing to fracture growth and development. So a few things that I'll point out here include the fact that indeed there is still the crack that we had previously, and it's advanced by some kind of distance, delta A. So we're really looking at the crack tip in this extended zone of fracture now. But what's fascinating about this is that you kind of see that if you were to actually look at the material at this level of detail and at this scale, you'll notice that as the material starts to deform around this localized kind of crack tip, if it's steel or if it's any other kind of material that undergoes even just a little bit of you know plastic deformations, what you'll find is that there's a lot of localized plastic deformation and plasticity occurring in the local vicinity of the crack tip. And depending on the behavior of the material, whether it's very brittle or, or if it's very ductile, this zone of plastic deformation uh, will be relatively small in the case of brittle fracture or it might be relatively large in the case of ductile fracture but in either case you'll definitely have some localized plastic deformations because the stresses in the vicinity of the crack tip tend to be very high compared to the stresses throughout the rest of the body and we'll see exactly what that looks like in subsequent slides but that excessive you know, plastic deformation and changes in uh, what's happening in the material microstructure, that plastic deformation will further lead to other kinds of things. You know, at some point, the material will simply fail to sustain the ability to deform plastically in the vicinity of this crack tip. And you might start to see little micro cracks develop throughout the material. And they might not be very big to begin with, but eventually those micro cracks will start to grow and develop almost voids or empty space in the material uh, called micro voids. And as those micro voids continue to grow and separate, you might start to get even more localized plastic deformation and you might have this kind of crack bridging behavior where small strands of material will kind of draw out almost and try to bridge uh, the connections between the crack until eventually they coalesce. These kind of small bridges break and then finally you have whole scale crack extension. But clearly there's a lot going on in this region of going from you know, crack tip plasticity to micro crack development to micro void uh, growth and 
and eventually coalescence of these microvoids into crack extension. And this whole process really indicates that it's not as simple as just the crack extends. You know, it's not that there's either a crack there or there's not. Really, the line between fractured material and, you know, totally unfractured material is very blurred. And this zone of material where all these interesting things are happening is sometimes called the fracture process zone, really giving some kind of definition to this thought that fracture is not just an instantaneous thing. At a macroscopic view, it certainly looks like there's a crack there or there isn't, and that's you know the whole story. At the micro scale, it's a much more complicated picture, and, and really it is a process. It has to go through a whole sequence of different you know, fine scale mechanisms to ultimately lead to visible crack extension at the macro scale. And if you look even further down, you know, to look at any one of these micro cracks or maybe at the edge of a growing micro void, what you'll find is that really the, the true atomistic scale perspective of fracture, as you might kind of rightly think of it, it really corresponds to atomistic uh, debonding. So breaking of the bonds between atoms in the original kind of lattice configuration of the material. So that's really what fracture means at the, at the most fine scale of, you know, this whole multi-scale perspective of fracture. Well, you know, it, it really corresponds to just the bonds between atoms breaking. So, but it, it really, fracture encompasses this whole picture. It's all of these things put together and it's really impossible to separate them from one another or to kind of skip between them. Uh, it really is important to consider all of the detail that's happening across these different scales of interest. So with all that said, and with sort of a perspective of what's really going on in the material, uh, these different scales, let's actually take a, a view of what's going on in, in a particular specimen of interest. Maybe not that, maybe more detailed view of a, a fracture specimen like the compact tension specimen, but Let's look at a classical solution that was originally developed by a guy called Westergaard, where he applied this uh, you know, concept that we've used before, the airy stress function, to come up with analytical solutions to this problem as shown on the left, which is just a simple, you know, it looks like a finite plate, but it's actually the solution was developed for an infinite plate subjected to some kind of far field tensile loading, sigma naught, and Let's also, to make things fun, put in this local feature, a small crack of width 2a. And let's also kind of define our coordinate system such that we're measuring uh, coordinates relative to maybe this right edge of the crack. Now, Westergaard, using the airy stress function in a rather complicated, complex uh, format, was able to come up with an exact analytical solution to this problem to find what is the stress distribution in this infinite plate and more specifically in the vicinity local to this crack tip region. And he came up with the solution and it looks kind of like this, looking in particular at the yy component of stress or the normal component of stress in the direction of the applied tensile loading. What you'll notice is you can kind of plot what's the stress variation in the yy stress as a function of x relative to this position here, the origin. So further away from the crack, you'll notice that mm, the stress levels out and actually asymptotically approaches the far field state of stress as we would kind of expect. And that's sort of in agreement with that uh, solution that we looked at previously for the plate with a circular hole kind of problem. There too, we also have that in the far field conditions, as you move further and further away from the hole, you approach a state of uniform stress in agreement with the far field stress conditions. But as you approach the edge of this crack, the stresses increase. And in the case of the plate with the hole, the stress is increased to a finite value that was proportional to three times the average stress. In this case, however, in the case of a crack, the stress zooms off to an infinite value as you approach this crack tip location. And that's kind of unsatisfying. It's unsatisfying largely because we know that there's no way that the material can sustain an infinite stress. That's just unphysical. It's a limitation of the way that we've developed our theory of elasticity, 
uh, by assuming linear elastic material behavior, it doesn't actually work that way. There's no way for the material to sustain these infinite stresses. It's a limitation in the way that we've actually come up with uh, these, uh, you know, elastic assumptions in the relations between stress and strain. Really, there should be some kind of plasticity or some kind of more complicated material behavior going on. But to come up with solutions that account for plastic deformations, analytical solutions like the one shown here, that's practically impossible. At least, you couldn't come up with good approximations to it using numerical methods, but at the time that these solutions were developed, such methods were just not available. Nonetheless, it's worth at least taking a look at this particular solution, even noting the deficiency that this is really not a physical result, that the stresses will truly not be infinite in the vicinity of the crack tip. Nonetheless, while the stress might zoom off to infinity, it's interesting to note that if we were to look at, hmm, what happens in the limit of not sigma yy as in the limit as x goes to zero, but in le instead let's look at something slightly different. Well, let's look at a quantity that maybe involves sigma yy times the square root of x. And you'll notice that, you know, this term, the square root of x multiplied by sigma yy, we can make some substitutions, we can uh, maybe even apply classical L'Hopital's rule to this expression to maybe manipulate it a little bit and simplify it even further. And, you know, after making these adjustments, we actually notice that this term, the square root of x times sigma yy, actually does converge to a finite value in contrast to the limit as sigma yy, you know, in the limit of x goes to zero. Sigma yy goes to infinity, but if you multiply it by a square root of x, actually you get a finite value, and it looks kind of like this. It converges to sigma naught, the far field stress value, times the square root of a divided by 2. So while it doesn't really make sense to look at stresses in the vicinity of the crack tip, we can still look at other things. We can look at, in particular, this quantity. What happens not in the limit is sigma yy and as x goes to zero, but square root of x times sigma yy in the limit as x goes to zero. And then we should get a finite value that comes out of this. Now, if you look at you know, some of the literature, they don't just say square root of x times sigma yy. They add this extra factor of 2 pi in here for some reason. And it's not entirely clear why they do this, but that's what they do. And we'll go along with it just to humor whoever came up with it. But in any case, rather than trying to measure what's happening in the local vicinity of the crack, right as, you know, x goes towards zero, we know we can't really measure what's going on with the stress because it's going to be infinite. But we can measure this thing. In the limit as x goes to zero, we'll get this finite value. And it so happens that this finite value that we obtain from this limit in looking at this quantity, this particular limit has a specific name. It is called the so-called stress intensity factor. And I'll be even more particular. I'll call this the mode one stress intensity factor. You'll see why in a minute. But the mode one stress intensity factor is really, you could think of it as a specialized way of trying to measure how big the stresses are in the local vicinity of the crack tip. As I said, we can't measure what the stress is right at the crack tip because it's going to be infinite. So there's really no good way to compare, oh, how big is this infinite value of stress in the crack tip vicinity versus this infinite value. It just doesn't make sense. We can't compare infinity to infinity. But we can compare a relative intensity measure that applies to the stress and which also involves some dependence on the geometry of this plate structure. And we call this, again, the stress intensity factor. It has some very unusual units. Because we're taking some stress times the square root of 2 pi times x, which has units of length, the resulting units of the stress intensity factor have units of stress times the square root of length. So things that look like megapascals times the square root of meters, or kips per square inch times the square root of inches. It's really a non-physical unit. Uh, 
and, and it doesn't really have any physical interpretation other than the fact that it came from exactly taking this limit which gave us a, some kind of finite number in the limit as x went to zero. That's why it has these units and again it really doesn't have a good physical intuition behind it so don't try to rationalize that so much. So what's useful about the stress intensity factor is that we can actually come up with different values for what this stress intensity factor should be by looking at different solutions obtained for other interesting geometries and loading conditions. So the stress intensity factor as shown here for this classical solution of an infinite plate with the far field loads of sigma naught and a crack of length 2a, in this case the mode 1 stress intensity factor is simply this. It's sigma naught times the square root of pi times a. Mm, very cool. But that's not true for all possible different you know plate geometries and loading conditions and in general if you have let's say a, a different loading scenario with a plate of finite width and maybe uh, or a plate with maybe two cracks along the edges with finite width or other interesting things going on you you can come up with different values for this stress intensity factor and they're all still defined in this same way through this limit so really this expression the mode one stress intensity factor being defined through this limiting function given some exact solution for what the sigma yy stress field should be in this particular problem in the limit as you know you approach the edge of the crack really this is the proper definition of the stress intensity factor it requires that you solve the original elasticity problem for the stress field and figure out what its value should be multiplied by this extra term in the limit as you approach you know the actual location of the crack tip that's how you actually would compute the stress intensity factor in general but it requires as i just said finding the elasticity solution for sometimes very complicated problems to obtain the stress field and, and then take the limit as you approach the edge of this crack obviously that requires a lot of work and it requires <laughs> you know possibly doing this for a lot of variable geometries Thankfully, people have gone through the trouble of solving these different problems for a variety of common configurations of, you know, different specific geometries and specific types of loading and have come up with, you know, generalized expressions for what the resulting stress intensity factor should be uh, given these variable geometries and loading conditions. So this kind of gives you a sense, and I've taken some of these tables directly from the textbook. Uh, showing how you might compute the stress intensity factor using this sort of approximated expression that involves uh, that original kind of classical result for the case of an infinite plate with a crack of width 2a uh, but also multiplied by some additional we'll call it a geometry factor it's a geometry dependent uh, correction factor that depends on uh, the crack size a and possibly normalized by things like the dimension or width of the plate in the case of a plate-like geometry to which we're intending to extend the original expression for the crack or the stress intensity factor. So there's some extra modifications we have to do but it really just looks like this. It maybe adds some extra uh, geometry correction factor that depends on various conditions like what's the type of loading and other kind of things like the dimension of the plate or the relative dimensions of the crack compared to the width of the plate. So all of that taken into account, we can then just say, ah, well, for this particular plate geometry and this particular, you know, crack size to plate width ratio, I can then plug these values in and directly figure out what is the stress intensity factor for a given plate geometry and a particular loading scenario. So people have already done this work for you you all you have to do is find the appropriate table wherever it is and figure out what the stress intensity factor is and and you can use this information to then figure out well what do the stresses look like in the local vicinity of the crack tip and the stress intensity factor as I said is really providing you with a measure of how big the stresses are in the vicinity of the crack tip now that might not necessarily be a satisfying result in some cases, you might actually want to visualize 
well, what, what is the exact distribution of stress in the local vicinity of the crack tip? And it turns out that as you look closer and closer to the edge of one of these cracks, the solution starts to look basically the same regardless of the, maybe the particular geometry that you're looking at and regardless of the loading conditions that you're applying to this plate. As you get closer and closer to the crack tip, all those details further away from the crack tip start to become irrelevant. And the stress fields that appear due to whatever you know solution that you obtain will all start to kind of look the same. So in this particular loading configuration and geometry, and in this configuration, and this one, and this one, and really any one that you could think of, as you zoom in your perspective really, really close to the crack tip, the stress fields will all basically look the same. And it's useful to look at solutions to problems that really try to examine what do those stress fields look like really, really close to the crack which have really general applicability to any of these different loading and geometry situations. To analyze this, there are really three primary modes of fracture which can occur and which result in different appearances in how those stress fields will manifest close to the crack tip. And they can be categorized into mode one, which is a classical opening mode of fracture where the material is literally pulling apart Mode two, which is kind of like a shearing deformation as shown in this middle figure here, where it's kind of like you're pushing in the top half of this block of material and pulling the bottom half out and generating a fracture through kind of a shearing mechanism. And then there's mode three, which is tearing. It's kind of like the mode of fracture that you would occur if you took a piece of paper and you literally tried to tear it in half like that. So subjecting the specimen in, less, in this case, let's say, to anti-plane shearing deformations, which is kind of like you're loading now this thin piece of material, not due to in-plane loading conditions, but due to out-of-plane or transverse loading conditions. And these three different modes of fracture fully en encompass the all the possible ways in which a crack might propagate and the resulting stresses that would develop around the crack tip. So as long as you can characterize what's happening in each of these three different distinct modes of fracture and, and deformation local to the crack tip, you basically characterize everything there is to know about at least the stress field local to the crack tip. So in the mode one case, in the case where the stresses are trying to pull the crack open in this mode one opening uh, mode of fracture, the stress field looks kind of like this. Assuming that you've computed your mode one stress intensity factor from your elasticity solution, wherever it came from, or maybe you've pulled it out of a table somewhere for whatever particular geometry and loading scenario that you've previously determined, you can determine what that mode one stress intensity factor is and then plug it in to this resulting expression uh, for the stress field local to the crack tip. And really this solution only applies in the limit as you get closer and closer to the crack tip. So in the limit as the radial distance r from the crack tip goes to zero, this particular solution field for the stresses, uh, the in-plane stresses in particular, uh, becomes valid. And it'll look the same, again, regardless of the loading scenario, regardless of the geometry of the plate. So in this particular case, you'll notice that Sigma XX, there's definitely some large infinite stresses, uh, even in this kind of like XX stress, which is kind of the stress in this horizontal direction. Uh, it kind of dies off as you move further away from the crack tip in different directions. Sigma YY, that's the tensile or opening uh, stress that actually drives crack opening. You'll notice it has this kind of funny, I don't know what you would call this. It's sort of like a lima bean shape or something like that, or kidney bean shape, uh, the stress contours indicate that the stresses also zoom off to infinity. Really all of these different components of stress, sigma xx, yy, and xy, they all increase to infinite values as you get closer and closer to the crack tip, but they do so in slightly different ways that depends on uh, 
you know, along what angular coordinate are you looking at? And this, you know, shear stresses, there's certainly infinite shear stresses. Ultimately, though, it's still the YY stresses that are driving crack opening. These are the stresses that would actually result in crack extension. And these are the stresses that you would look at if you were interested in figuring out, you know, is there going to be some kind of increase or separation in the material? So mode one stress intensity factor leads to these particular, uh, you know, modes of uh, stresses in the material uh, in the limit as R goes to zero. And if you looked at mode two, this kind of shearing mode of deformation, it looks a little bit different. But still, the, the stress fields all go to infinity. They all depend on this kind of mode two stress intensity factor defined somewhat differently rather than the mode one stress intensity factor which involved the limit as square root of 2 pi r multiplied by sigma yy and the limit as r goes to zero now for mode two it's almost the same thing just switch it out and it's defined as the limit that involves sigma xy the shearing stress the in you know the in plane shearing stress that is that limit defines the mode 2 stress intensity factor and you can plug it in in a similar fashion and notice that all the stresses zoom off to infinity in the local vicinity of the crack tip uh, but they do so in different ways nonetheless it is still the sigma xy mode of stress that really generates that kind of shearing deformation or the shearing separation that leads to propagation of a crack that would extend further off to the right uh, so along this plane, it's really the, the shearing stresses that are driving crack growth. And then lastly, the mode 3 stress intensity factor involves the sigma yz component of stress in the limit as r goes to zero to define the mode 3 stress intensity factor. And in this case, there are no in-plane modes of stress, but rather there are only anti-plane stresses. So sigma xz and sigma yz but again, it's the sigma yz component of stress that leads to really the fracture behavior or crack extension behavior. So kind of interesting. It's useful to be able to at least visualize these things and understand, well, what do the stresses really look like? They all zoom off to infinity, clearly, which really presents a challenge because at least if we're working with these analytical solutions and if we wanted to use our classical theory of elasticity to understand and predict when is fracture going to occur in some chunk of material it would be really nice to be able to say well fracture is going to occur when the stress reaches some critical value just like we did in the case of plasticity plasticity was a purely stress-based failure criterion we formulated it in terms of the von Mises stress measure which is a direct measurement on what the value of stress is in this kind of deviatoric mode of failure. But we can't do that anymore in the case of fracture mechanics. And it has to do precisely with this issue that, well, the stresses are, at least according to these analytical solutions, the stresses zoom off to infinity. So there's no way to really formulate a stress-based failure criterion be, at least one that applies to these approximate solutions that admit infinite stresses because oh, the stresses, how do you, how do you formulate a, a criterion that involves an infinite stress? At least any such criterion we could develop that would be purely stress-based would tell us that mm, this, regardless of what that criterion says, the, the crack should have already happened that you know the stress is going to be infinite regardless of like the intensity regardless of how much load we're applying the stress is going to be infinite so how do we know when fracture will actually start well again it means we can't really apply a purely stress-based failure criterion to evaluate when will a crack grow or when will a crack you know uh, you know start all that all that basically says we can't use stress-based failure criteria we need something else and the something else that we're going to use is precisely this stress intensity factor. It's the thing that didn't zoom off to infinity in the limit as we got closer and closer to the crack tip. So even though the stresses zoom off to infinity, we know that this stress intensity factor, 
which is you know the stress multiplied by this extra square root of x or square root of r term that thing at least stays a finite value even as you get closer and closer to the crack tip so let's try maybe using a or developing a fracture criterion that is expressed in terms of that quantity the stress intensity factor and that's precisely what a lot of these classical uh, methods for developing fracture criteria did you know and it largely applies and is a pretty good predictor for mostly brittle materials and brittle fracture in those cases you can apply this sort of stress intensity factor based uh, failure criterion to assess when fracture will occur uh, by constructing a relatively simple inequality like the one shown here. We define that fracture will occur when the stress intensity factor exceeds some critical value. And it turns out that this critical value is effectively a material property. It's something that doesn't change depending on the loading scenario or depending on the geometry of the structure that you're kind of putting under these loading conditions. So it's something that's intrinsic to the material itself. You could run an experiment, you could measure, you know, based on the stress intensity factor at which fracture actually initiates, you could define that critical value that you measured as precisely this material property. And using that, you could run a different experiment with a different geometry and different loading conditions. And, and you would find that it really should come out to be the same, that if you tried to assess the value of this critical uh, stress intensity factor, sometimes also called the fracture toughness, that it would turn out to be roughly the same value, which is pretty cool. It means that I can measure this thing in a single experiment and then apply it as a failure criterion for much more general scenarios and other kinds of loading scenarios and other interesting domains. So again, fracture occurs, we say, when the stress intensity factor exceeds this critical stress intensity factor or the fracture toughness a material property if however i load the material up and i find that my stress intensity factor is below this critical value then i say oh well i'm fine there should be no fracture occurring and if there was a crack there then the crack shouldn't grow it shouldn't increase in size or length so that's good if you're trying to design some structure such that it doesn't fracture, clearly you want K1, the stress intensity factor, to be less than K1C. Um, that's, that's kind of your criterion to evaluate, <laughs> will it fail or not? Uh, but in the general case where maybe you have K1 greater than or equal to this critical value, then clearly fracture propagation will occur. It's a little bit of a different scenario compared to the case of plasticity, where in the case of plasticity, we said that really the stress cannot go outside of the yield surface. And if it tried to go outside of the yield surface, then you really had to have evolution of plastic strain in order for you know, the stress to be de decreased proportionally such that the stress was always either inside or on the yield surface. Now, this fracture criterion allows actually for the mode one stress intensity factor, K1, uh, to potentially exceed this critical value. And what happens if it exceeds it, uh, or you know, is at least equal to it, you know, dictates various other things uh, pertinent to you know, assessing whether the crack growth itself is stable or unstable. And to really understand what that distinction means stable versus unstable crack growth it, it's useful to look at a particular example so let's take this relatively simple example of a plate of finite width w and a finite crack size a naught subjected to far field loading conditions sigma naught and let's suppose that i don't know the length of the plate in the vertical direction is relatively long compared to this width dimension w but we don't really care exactly how long it just needs to be long enough so that we can apply St. Venant's principle and say that, you know, we don't really care exactly how those far field, you know, conditions are applied as long as they're roughly uniform and far enough away. Okay, in that particular scenario, we can come up with what is the stress intensity factor. 
we can go to those tables that we had previously and figure out what is the actual stress intensity factor expressed in terms of this far field you know stress state sigma naught in terms of other aspects of the geometry like the initial crack length a and also including some other effects like the geometry dependent correction factor or the relative crack size a divided by the relative width of the plate so some lambda let's say the correction factor for the geometry depending on a over w okay so in general before fracture occurs and assuming that we start out with the plate totally unloaded with an additional crack size of a naught what we'll find is we can try to start loading up this plate we can take sigma naught and start from a value of zero and slowly increase it you know to a larger and larger values and what that will look like in this diagram that plots crack size on the x axis versus stress intensity factor k1 on the vertical axis what we'll find is 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 that you know as the crack size stays the same it's not growing at this point we find that the stress intensity factor will continue to increase as we increase the amount of load that we're applying so sigma naught is increasing but crack size is staying fixed so the crack is not growing and that happens to be the case anytime we have the stress intensity factor you know less than some critical value the k1c the fracture toughness of the material so as long as we, you know we can increase this value sigma naught to increasing values of stress and as long as the resulting stress intensity factor stays below this critical value of the fracture toughness then the crack isn't going to grow and it'll look on the diagram kind of like where we have this k1 measurement you know at the same value of a a naught the initial crack length and it'll just be kind of increasing and as long as it's below this critical threshold then you know th there's no crack growth occurring now consider what happens if we ramp up that value of stress all the way up to the point where now we have k1 equals k1c right at this instant let's say we ramp up sigma naught such that k1 equals k1c exactly which is corresponding to this point on this diagram in that scenario clearly we have that you know k1 equals k1c which means that crack extension will occur when crack extension happens we'll go from a crack that was originally of size a naught to now a crack that has size a naught plus some delta a and it might not grow this big to begin with you know if it started out here maybe a little bit of crack growth might put it here so it's like you know, a naught plus a little tiny extra fraction delta a naught so the crack has grown just a little bit due to the fact that we're satisfying our fracture criterion and we expect that the crack is going to grow it's going to extend but even if the crack extends just a little bit just a tiny bit if we say that our loading conditions are applied such that we're holding this external load sigma naught fixed regardless of how the crack is extending or regardless of how the plate is kind of moving up if we're doing a load control experiment in other words such that we're holding this external load fixed uh, you know continuously and we're trying to hold it there at the same value of sigma naught then what will happen is that the stress intensity factor will change and even though we're holding sigma naught fixed what's changing is the crack size a so as a continues to get bigger and bigger as, as the crack extends even just a little bit the stress intensity factor will change and in the case of this particular plate geometry we'll notice that it actually increases this lambda will increase as a function of a divided by w and you know this square root of pi times a term will also increase as a increases so clearly even if we're holding you know this far field value of stress fixed increasing the crack size due to a crack extension will lead to an increasing value of k1 so if the crack extends just a little bit there was you know holding the stress still fixed it means that k1 the stress intensity factor is going to increase and at this new point after the crack is extended a little bit 
and with the same value of far field stress, we notice that we're still, you know, violating this constraint, that we're still in this scenario where K1 is in excess of the fracture toughness, which means that the crack is gonna continue to extend. So it'll do it again. The crack will try to continue to extend even more. And in doing so, it'll cause the stress intensity factor to go up even more. And it'll continue on in this fashion with the crack continue to extend and the stress intensity factor continuing to grow off until the basically the crack extends and cracks all the way through the plate uh, you know and cleaves it in two now you might not necessarily have the time to go through this as it's actually happening in real life if you were to run this experiment you, what you'd find is that really the crack would extend almost instantaneously through that the entire specimen and it would seem as though everything happened all at once there was no kind of cyclic kind of feedback loop of crack growth leading to increase in stress intensity factor you know it all happens very suddenly and that behavior of the crack extending and basically failing the entire specimen instantaneously in this very dramatic way is what we might refer to as unstable crack growth it's where small increases in crack size lead to also corresponding increases in the stress intensity factor. And that kind of feedback loop then leads to just continuation of crack growth in this totally uncontrolled way that leads to catastrophic and very sudden failure of the entire specimen. Now that's not descriptive of all scenarios in which crack growth occurs. There are certainly other types of scenarios you know, as you might guess, stable crack growth scenarios in which a small increase in crack length doesn't necessarily lead to an increase in stress intensity factor. And so you might be able to actually see the crack grow little by little as you try to increase, you know, the loading applied to the specimen. It all depends on how you've designed the specimen and how you're assigning the loading. For most load controlled experiments, you will find that unstable crack growth will occur. And it precisely has to do with this. If you're holding sigma naught fixed, typically the dependence of K1 on the geometry and the extension of the crack will be an increasing one. So as the crack continues to grow with, at a fixed value of stress, the stress intensity factor will grow. Basically what that means is that if you're trying to run uh, a, a stable crack growth experiment by applying some uh, load control, then you'll probably end up with the specimen just dramatically failing. And you'll never be able to achieve stable crack growth conditions in most cases. To really achieve stable crack growth, you kind of have to do something different. You have to do something more like uh, displacement control. And that's typically what people do in these fracture experiments. They don't necessarily use load control, but rather they control the displacements. And in doing so, they get around some of these things. Because as the crack grows, the compliance of the specimen increases, and that happens to also seemingly decrease the a value of load that gets applied through the specimen. And that corresponding or apparent decrease in load at a fixed value of increased you know, uh, displacement applied to the specimen basically means that you can you know, actually have the stress intensity factor decrease with increasing crack length. So stable crack growth really corresponds to the stress intensity factor going down as the crack continues to extend. And it all depends on how you're applying the loads and how you're des designing the specimen and, and the geometry. All right, so that's our brief introduction to fracture mechanics. If you have questions, feel free to post them in the chat and hopefully uh, I'll get back to you soon. Otherwise, we'll continue in class in person on Thursday. I'll look forward to seeing you all then.